So I titled this talk, uh, Scientific Computing While Supercomputing. OK, so yeah, this last spring, I've been at Continuum Analytics, which is a company based in Austin, Texas. But they've also got an office in Europe now as well. And they sort of do a lot of different things. So it's, it's kind of hard to, to corner them. But yeah, they're basically a Python technology lab. And they sort of have four tiers right now, products, training, support, and consulting. <coughs> You might be familiar with Anaconda, the Python distribution, or Wakari. There's also Numba, which is the sort of compiler tool that I've been working on in the last couple of months. And uh, finally, Blaze, which is a next generation sort of NumPy. I'm just going to throw some buzzwords out here for you. Lazy expression evaluation, rich grammar for typing, and a gill-free runtime library using real threads and sophisticated parallelization backends. Blaze is a DARPA-funded project, so it'll, it's being developed out in the open. And it's uh, an open source library as well. So you know, if you're interested in participating in that, just come talk to me after the talk. Scientific computing while supercomputing. So this is a originally Greg Wilson's talk, so I just forked it. So uh, we'll open with a quote from Scott Hanselman, who was discussing these dark matter developers. And he said, we hypothesize that there's another kind of developer than the one we meet all the time. We call them dark matter developers. They don't read a lot of blogs. They never write blogs. They don't go to user groups. They don't tweet or Facebook. And you don't see them at all at large conferences. So by being here, you've, you've basically excluded yourself from the dark matter developer club. Sorry. They aren't chasing the latest beta, beta or pushing limits. They're just producing. Then he goes on to say, they use mature products that are well known, well tested, and well understood. For example, in the embedded product space C and C++. Now for us, that's our bread and butter, right? But, but for him and, and, and these people who are out using Ruby and GitHub and all of these other tools, they think of us as, as dinosaurs, right? He's, he's trying to change that, that mentality. He says, you know, they use mature products. They aren't chasing the latest beta or pushing any limits. They're just producing. Or are they just totally chilling and punching out at five? But I like to think they're producing. Point is, we need to find a balance between those of us online yelling and tweeting and pushing towards the next big thing and those that are unseen and patient and focused on the business problem at hand. I think of us as a scientific computing community as mostly dark matter developers when we're not at conferences. Because we don't go and, and chase web 3.0, and most of us aren't tweeting about what's going on at the conference. I think it's only me, and so on. But I'm not that optimistic in general about how well we're taking advantage of technology. We're in this elite 1%, right? Everybody here in this room is, is part of the 1%. But there's another 90% that isn't worried about all of these awesome tools and all these technologies and all these languages that we're talking about today. And it's not because they don't want to do this stuff and, and run on supercomputers, but Exascale is, is really out of reach, and, and Petascale is out of reach, and Terascale is sometimes out of reach. You know, Parallel is the challenge for them. We have the shiny toys, right? But for them, you know, they don't see this picture. They, they see a, a grimy reality, right? So here we are. There's us and there's them, right? And, and you guys are all in the us. I, I don't think anybody in here is, is having the, the difficulties and the challenges that we you know, encounter as a, as a field or as, as science as a whole, accomplishing tasks in computing and just sort of these basic fundamentals. I get challenged on this, and, and Greg gets challenged on this all the time. People say, well, surely you're exaggerating. There aren't that many people who, who don't know how to use a shell script to automate their data analysis. Well, actually a little less than half do, right? And only a quarter of them are using version control. And half of that understand how to modularize their code. And then we're down to the smallest fraction that even understand why they're doing it. So we've left the majority behind. I think it's safe to say that other than Googling for things, science is, you know, scientists as a whole are not using computers any more efficiently than they did three decades ago. But you know, things are much easier, things like Stack Exchange, Wikipedia, uh, there's a lot of resources available online that blog posts that weren't available before. OK, so you'll say, well, that's not my problem. And unless you're the director of a supercomputing center, maybe it isn't. But if you're running on these computers and your colleagues aren't, then they're not using your software. And you're not using their software. So you guys aren't exchanging anything. You're, you're exchanging at the talking level or the ideas level or the papers level, but you're not exchanging at the code level and you're not benefiting, and science loses. But the worst situation is if they are using your computers, because they're filling your front end with useless jobs, they're filling your queues, and they're filling your disk. And anybody who's logged into a supercomputing center and, and done any serious work knows that these users exist. I've, I've hopefully 
created an existing proof here, and science loses. Okay, so some quotes some from the meeting so far this week from Jeff, Salman, and, and Pete. The first two are, are about software sort of sustainability and provenance. There's a very good chance that some code that you write today will outlast you. Uh, it used to be that you came into grad school or you came into a research group and you would write a bunch of code from scratch and two years later that code would disappear. But code that I wrote when I was 20 or 21 is still being used in, in research today, so 10 years from ago. The, the worst code you could possibly imagine is, is still being used today. And of course, definitely code that I wrote three years ago, I look back at it because I have to fix it and I wonder what I was thinking. I guess I'm not the only one, maybe. Uh, and then finally, uh, Pete's last uh, statement, uh, he recommended that we invested in a bunch of things, but he also said nightly test and build configuration, embedded versioning, and metadata. So we'll, we'll have time for some questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna poll the audience uh, a little bit later from now, but I, wa I want you to think about what you're doing sort of from this list and, and how that impacts your own software. So we've set some very, very, very basic low goalposts, right? This is, if you're using a computer, and I'm not talking a cluster, I'm not talking a GPU, I'm just talking about a computer, to do your science. Are you managing your software and data? Can you tell if you've written a piece of code, whether it's in MATLAB or Visual Basic or C, whether it's working correctly? Can you find and fix problems when you encounter them? Do you know how to keep track of what you've done through provenance and then find those results later? Can you share your work with others through something a little bit more sophisticated than uh, an FTP server? And can you do all of these things efficiently, right, in an automated way? This is a driver's license exam that was developed in collaboration with the Software Sustainability Institute, uh, which is a UK organization uh, at the national level, uh, with the Dirac Consortium, which is their, one of the UK supercomputing resources. So it's a, a consortium of supercomputers. And what this is is just a basic skill test. And when you think about this test, of course, I want you to score yourself, and hopefully you'll all pass. But think about other people that you work with and don't name names or anything or, or go any direction, but, but think about other people that you're working with or collaborating with, maybe a student you've had or an advisor or a colleague, and, and things that they've either forced you into or, or you've had to avoid because you were working with them. So first of all, can you check out a working copy of the exam materials from a Git repository? If somebody gives you a URL that contains a Git repository, can you put that on your computer? And if you could do it easily, it's a one. If you'd struggle, that's half a point. If you wouldn't want to know where to start, it's zero. If you don't even understand what I'm saying, then you have to subtract one from your score. And, and these four will be the same throughout this exam. Just accumulate, that's an atomic operation, into a single <laughs> register. Uh, but everybody here has their own private variable, so I don't expect to have any uh, race conditions or anything like that. Use find and gref in a pipe to create a list of all files and a, and a copy. Direct the output to a file and then add that file to the repository. So there's a mixture of some shell commands here and then you gotta know a little bit of Git as well. Again, keep score. Can you write a shell script that runs a legacy program and then set over a variety of parameters? And not just changing one parameter, but say changing four or five parameters and collect those, those out. Could you edit a make file that was running and, and compiling the code but so that it actually ran the code for you and then recreated a corresponding output file? Moving into the testing side of thing, could you write unit tests to exercise a function, a simple function that just calculates running sum? And could you explain why your four tests are more likely to uncover bugs in the function? And then explain how even though you have a function that could pass the tests, it could still fail on real world, world data. Well, unless you write four extremely good tests, but I can't, I can't think of one. And then finally, could you do a code review of a legacy program and list the four most important improvements you would make? I can think of several people who have completed this exam that would not have a positive score. And they're actively contributing to science, they're publishing papers, every once in a while they're retracting papers, but how well did you do? Let's say, who, who is a five out of five here? Hopefully, <laughs> good, good, good. Who's a seven out of seven? Okay, who's uh, over five? Who's over three? Okay. Anybody who didn't raise their hands, I'm not gonna make you state that you did less than that. So how well do you think most computational scientists would do? And do you think that a comp computational scientist could use your Petascale computer without 
understanding those skills. Maybe a four or five is enough. Maybe, uh, I, I, I used Git here, but maybe you don't need to use Git as your version control system. But I think those level, those minimum things are probably important. But more importantly is a grasp of the principles of why they're important. What we've learned from software engineering that has come over into scientific software engineering. So why is this your problem? If we only have a very, very small group of people who know how to use supercomputers, then we'll always just have a small group of people that use supercomputers. And as supercomputing technologies go from big supercomputing centers down to workstations and, and into things like the cloud, these people won't be advancing science. And we want them to advance science. Science as a whole is something that benefits from advanced technology. So it's obvious that we need to put some more computing courses in the curriculum, except you know, like an overstuffed suitcase, the, the curriculum is already full. And I've had several people tell me this, that there's just no way that a graduate student who's going to be doing computational fluid dynamics or material science will have time in a three-year schedule to take a semester-long course about the fundamental skills they need in scientific computing. OK, so maybe we just put a little computing in each course. But that adds up. And it's the first thing cut when you're, you're squeezed for time. And it may also be an example of the blind leading the blind if the instructor themselves is not sort of competent in this material. So what has worked, we target graduate students, but we do it in an intensive short course, two days to two weeks. So uh, at PESC is not an example of a software carpentry workshop, but it's exactly, uh, if we did an extended course, it would look like this without the six to nine hacking sessions, <laughs> which have been awesome, actually. I've, I've been super productive this week. I, I've been surprised by how well this, how much fun this has been. And a focus on practical skills. That's software carpentry. Uh, that's our uh, URL down at the bottom. Here's our funding. Recently, we've been operating off of a large grant from the Alfred Sloan Foundation in partnership with Mozilla. That has just been renewed and expanded to a larger sort of mission. We've also had plenty of support from other sponsors throughout the years. I, I won't name all of them, but we also sort of collaborate in addition with the Software Sustainability Institute who runs the boot camps in the UK. So this is what we teach, Unix shell, Python, version control, testing, and then usually on the afternoon of the second day, there'll be some very specialized topic. And we've also been teaching more specialized boot camps that will be in a specific domain the entire time. For example, like bioinformatics, which is something we have been slowly growing into our, into our modular courses. Shell, we don't do anything complicated, just very, very simple automation, the basics of, of putting together a few different commands and then running them through pipes, so stuff that most of you have been doing since you were 18. We introduce them to Python, and this is interesting because we're, we try not to advocate specific technologies or specific approaches, but it turns out that Python is a very nice high-level language, it's open source, it's freely available, there's a really large collection of scientific libraries that have been implemented in Python. It's one of the few very high-level languages that's also supported on many supercomputers. So for example, IBM Blue Jane Q supports four languages officially, C, C++, Fortran, and Python. So you can start a Python instance just running it on a Blue Jane Q. We stood it up, I'd never been on a Q before this week, and we had one running in, in an hour and a half. We had a, we had a Python plus NumPy job going. That's why we do Python. We very much encourage testing. It's incredibly essential. I've actually taught a few software carpentry boot camps where we didn't do te uh, testing. I made the mistake of mentioning that on the mailing list, and I received about 10 emails in my inbox within half an hour explaining that I would be teaching testing for my future boot camp. And then finally, we do version control. And specifically, we, we teach Git which is a very challenging version control system to learn. But everybody has realized, and, and very few people in software carpentry love Git. I, I'm one of the few that love Git. I, I really, really like Git. But most people think it's a horrendous abomination with inconsistent syntax and, and very difficult semantics to understand. But it's taking over. And even, I would say, one of the largest competitors, for example, to Git, which is Mercurial, was supported by sort of this independent site called Bitbucket. Bitbucket was acquired by Atlassian. And in 2012, I think, they, set, they put out a blog post basically saying that they would support, not only were they supporting Git and Mercurial, but they found that Mercurial doesn't support really distributed workflows in the way that they want to. So they're actually actively encouraging Git as well, despite originally being a Mercurial version control host. And I think of that as probably the most sort of strong statement 
uh, for why Git will, will continue to dominate. So we teach all of these things, and uh, we go to scientists, and they say that's merely useful. And it's true. None of this stuff that we're teaching is publishable. So it's not a viable career track for anybody to go and teach software carpentry and you know, turn that into a uh, academic career path. But it works. Okay? We've had two independent assessments, and we continue to run assessments as we go at every boot camp. There's three different assessments that we'll run, specifically just to see how people improve and how they've done over the course. Uh, we've hosted them worldwide. We're still missing South America, but on my last, actually in the last six months, I was up here, and then I came down here, and I taught two, and then I went down to South Africa. If you know Fernando Perez, he did the one in Hawaii. He's a lucky guy. And I taught one at Tufts. I was in Seattle last week, and I taught one there. And I'll be teaching one in Vicksburg, Mississippi, at the US Army Corps of Engineers Research Lab in August, shortly before I start a position there. If you'd like to teach a workshop, uh, all of our materials are CC BY licensed, which means you can just pick them up and use them for yourself. If you want to call it a software carpentry workshop, you have to go through instructor training, which is an online thing and quite fun. So that strange blue oval there is you. You're all qualified, I'm sure, to teach a software carpentry workshop, but just a few more things to get you there. If you're not going to teach, as a reviewer, you can still help us. So when you're reviewing papers, think about including a few lines uh, about your software stack. Actually, when you're writing a paper, talk about what, what, your, what Git commit you were on when you, when you wrote your paper. Establish the provenance of your data sets and your figures. License your code. It, I, I suggest MIT or B, BSD, but it's most important that you have a license that's clear. And when you are reviewing, ask these questions. Make sure that the, the science that, that's being done is even if it's not completely out in the open, just make sure that it's reproducible. Uh, and I know that this doesn't seem like a direct connection to all of the things that I'm talking about, but there's this sort of science 2.0 movement where we're talking about all of these different things, about how we improve how science is done. And part of that is understanding how scientists use computers as a piece of the laboratory. If I go to the lab and I do a chemical experiment, you know, I put the two drops from this chemical in, and I put the two drops from this other chemical, and I sit and wait for 15 minutes, and then I throw it through the big spinny thing, and then out comes another chemical. I wrote all those steps down, and, you know, I signed my lab notebook if I'm in a really sort of uh, detail-oriented lab. And if somebody came back to me five years later and said, well, you said that you created this chemical using this procedure, you know, let's see your notes, I could reproduce them. But in science, of course, we, we typically don't do this, right? There, there are many, many fields where it's okay to publish a result, say that it was computed using a code, and then give no more details than the speed of the CPU that it was run on. Well, hopefully that will change, and hopefully uh, there are less excuses for that uh, nowadays. Just a few links. I'm, I'm wrapping up now. Pete told us not to go on Facebook, so the first thing we did was create a Facebook group page for all the members of AtPesk. Do you join it? It's actually, it's a really good networking thing. So, you know, now you're just running into people, and I'm forgetting names. I forgot my own name earlier this morning. But later on, if you want to look up somebody that, ran, that you ran into who was at a particular lab, if you want to ask them for a job, or you, know, you want to send a message, then go ahead and do that. Facebook's just the easiest way for us to quickly sort of gather everybody together. There's also so, sort of announcements for organizing out-of-workshop events. So you can go there. My page is there. That's just my first name and my last name, .net. Continuum has grabbed one of the I.O. Web, web URLs, and uh, Software Carpentry is the software-carpentry.org. Uh, finally, we're putting together a performance challenge for this week, and, and the idea is that Bill Gropp gave us a, a simple game of life code uh, that was implemented in C, and, and basically a complete game of life code. And what I'd like to do is, is throw down the gauntlet and ask everybody to write in their favorite programming language or paradigm a piece of code that we can run and sort of benchmark next week on Vesta. So uh, we're going to figure out exactly what the rules are going to be, uh, but, but that URL will, will be sort of where we collaborate, and we'll do it all Web 2.0, and you can issue a pull request with your source code, and we'll do automated regression testing on your code to make sure that it works. We'll have a Travis test set up, so, so all of those fun things. And if you have any questions about that, you can just see me after the talk, but I'll open it now to just general questions.